Uh, you mentioned uh, a cheque, million pounds. When was that? Uh, ten years ago, Brian. Oh, all of that. Long, yeah. long in that. We had three million. The development agency, we it? had three million <laughs> to spend, and we spent oh, it over God. three years what? on Norton and Radstock. And we earmarked a million to buy the 17 and a half acres in, in the middle of Radstock, which we did, and then handed it over to NRR. Nevertheless, somebody or other, a few of you, should have stood up and stuck, you know, push we them. Yeah. We, we did. did. No. We did. Thank the you, Thank you very much fantastic. for that contribution. Could I ask um, Heather Chipperfield? And I would just like to say, Leslie, when you said earlier that um, you'd made some, you'd been talking, you know, the plans that were coming from the developers. They have actually put plans in, and if you have a really good look at those plans, you can see that at the bottom end, towards um, Meadow View, they're actually um, building houses on the railway line. Yes. So if they get to do that, that's our railway line ever gone. So that is something that must be brought up at the planning meeting as another condition. They must move those houses back. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Richard Ellum. I'm a resident of Porton and have been since uh, the back end of 2000. Um, I've watched this story, perhaps kneeling comedy is an appropriate name, <laughs> <laughs> unfolding in the pages of the local paper for the last 13, 14 years. And I'm actually struck by one central fact that nobody's really mentioned here. The gentleman who's a railway consultant did raise it, and that is the fact that whatever you do, whatever you do with this railway, other than simply acknowledge that perhaps its day has gone, and lift the track, and even that's going to cost you something, whatever you do costs a great deal of money. That money has to come from somewhere, not just the money, to build whatever it is, but the interest in customers, whether they are people coming to have a go on a heritage railway, or whether they are commuters who are daft enough to spend an hour and a half travelling from Radstock to Bristol on the train when they can do it in 45 minutes in their car. But there's an awful lot, there is an awful lot of money to be found. It has to be economically viable in its own terms. Okay, the economics of heritage railways are different to the, the economics of um, a network rail connection. Our consultant gentleman mentioned an ATOP report. It will be quite interesting, perhaps, to know in summary what that said. But the real question is, and again, I don't see this as having been done, I don't see people doing the heavy lifting to produce the business case for any of these options. I see people who have been focused for the last umpteen years on something that they have as a legacy that they haven't really known what to do with. And what is needed, and again, it doesn't matter which of these plans we propose, if we're going to do something, there has to be a viable and costed plan for it. Now, in the time since the Marcroft Wagon Works closed, in North Wales, they've managed to rebuild the Welsh Highland Railway. They got something like 20 million quid from the National Lottery for that, support from the Welsh Government, all sorts of things. That was rebuilding a railway practically from scratch. They did it because they'd done the heavy lifting, because they were credible, because they could actually point to the fact that invest this money now and it will produce this return later. I don't think that information exists for this railway. And I'm sorry to say that until it, ha it does exist, and until that has been done, any discussion about its future is pretty much meaningless, because nobody actually knows what is, nobody actually knows what they're being asked to sign up to. But really, until we've got some serious plans, credible, costed plans for anything to do with this railway, we cannot move forwards at all. I, I can honestly tell you now, there isn't enough demand. There's enough demand along the railway, yes, just to have a single line 
running sort of once every hour, once every two hours, whatever. There isn't enough demand to have God knows how many trains going up through there. Only the one will do. Second point is, why do we need houses on this land? Why do we need houses? <laughs> 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 Manstock, the North Manstock area and Porton are struggling for businesses. They're struggling for employment. They're struggling for all sorts. There are not enough businesses in this area at all. What we need to do is invest this land into a railway site, a cycle lane, a bit of car park and so on and so on and some businesses. That's what needs to go in. That, that would then mean that people would be able to commute into Randstock using the train, using the buses, even using the cycling. There would be a lot more demand if there was more businesses going on that route. What we've been doing at the council is going out with um, small groups of residents to fill in um, assessment forms to look at whether sites are actually suitable. Now, alongside of that, I've been talking to Baines for some time, or trying to talk to Baines, about the need for not just housing, but business um, units as well in this area, because the majority of people that work, that live here, actually work, 80% work outside of, of our stock. I'm one of them. It takes me 45 minutes at the quickest to get to work. It can take you three hours when it's snowing. It's, it's ridiculous. But there's absolutely no plan, and having spoken to Baines, there's no plan at all to look at the infrastructure. And that's not just the road and the transport systems, it's the school, it's the doctors, it's everything else. There's very few places that you can actually work in, in livestock, and it's, it's a big issue. So it's a whole big thing that we need to be engaging with, with Baines about. Um, because it's not as, as simple as saying, well, we'd like this here because we'd like it. We have to look at all the facts and figures and, and look at making the, the case in the appropriate way, and then we can go forward and, um, and fight for it. The money, I was looking at um, money that's coming into the, the region through the, um, the local enterprise partnership. There's millions, but it's not coming here. It's going into Bath and it's going into Bristol, but it's not coming into Radstock. So we've got to start making a case for that. But there's got to be somewhere for it to go. And it's going to be all houses. Where, where, where are we going to put business units? I mean, there's a plan to knock the old bakery down and, and put houses on it, rather than convert it into business units. So we need your help to do that, those assessments. And uh, do, do contact us after tonight or at the end of this evening if you'd like to be involved. We don't have much time left to do those plans. There's not many. They're not, they're not difficult to do, but your help would be very much appreciated and your local knowledge is really important on that. Okay, I've got a couple more hands there. My concern, you know, I've lived in Radstock now 50 odd years. And when I came into Radstock, they had railway lines that took you to Bath, Bristol, Bournemouth, you, anywhere or such. I didn't need a car, just had a bike. And there was so much work around here, it was unbelievable. Now it's all gone. One of the reasons why it's gone is because of lack of infrastructure. No doubt about that. That's one of the reasons why Welton Biggie moved to Westbury. Look at the infrastructure mm. around Westbury. Mm. It's unbelievable. I don't agree with the, the gentleman from Kilmer Steve about keeping it as a footpath because I think of the next generation. All right, I'm going to be kicking up daisies when the railway comes, I'm sure of that. But I'm thinking of my grandchildren. That's what I'm thinking. And I'm trying to stop the building on that particular site down there. I've got it here, here's the proposals, and it shows that that is being built over with these proposed plans. And that is why I'm going to uh, this, this church on Wednesday to speak against that plan. Mm -hmm. wow. sure, um, That's the Apple Wall. Has he ever walked through Kilmers? Yes, many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. That's good. And it's lovely, isn't, isn't it? It is. Absolutely beautiful. We don't want to ruin it, do we? I'm not really a railway person, but what I want to I think about steam and, and that kind of thing. I just think that houses can be built anywhere. The railway camp. Mm. There's a history there, I know there's cost, you know, there's all these things, but the, the local council has been driven by the government 
to build houses because of the lack of them, you know, that's fair enough, but they can build houses anywhere. If that gets built on in any way, that's going to restrict any railway use. And you know, I'm not that old, but you know, my generation wants to have easy transport around the county and around the country. And when is it going to be you know, fuel issues in the future, which is you know already a big problem? The cost of fuel for cars is going to prohibit people to be able to transport around anyway. So the railway is the only viable you know, answer for this area. And until you know people take a view that they need a railway, they need transports around. You know that having houses there doesn't help anybody. But I mm. don't think. Well done. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. It's a good selling and point. I've been fighting the NRR development ever since 2005 with my neighbours. Uh, what I wanted to just say very briefly is um, I've met various councillors today who are on the development committee and they are and who will be voting here on Wednesday afternoon. Um, they want to know if it is definitely the case that the development in Area 3 would prevent the railway line from coming back ever again. So Most definitely. if you're on email, could you email development underscore control at bathness, B-A-T-H-N-E-S, dot gov dot UK and tell them this. And then this me your messages will be read out at the committee meeting if you can't manage to get there on Wednesday afternoon. But of course, we've got the church for the meeting. It will take hundreds of people up in the gallery, and if you were all up there, it would be simply wonderful. Thank you very much. I was lucky enough to see the last train leave from the Marcroft Wagon Works, and I've been fighting to have the railway reopened ever since. I'd like to point out, firstly, a few errors. There are only one Narragage Railway in South Wales, and that is the Brecon Mountain Railway, which I've visited a number of times. All the others are, in fact, reinstated standard gauge. Next point. A lot of people seem to have the conviction that this railway is going to take vast amounts of money. There are already examples in this country where railways have been reopened against all opposition and against all people telling them it's no, no longer possible. Prize example is the recent reopening of the uh, uh, Bluebell Railway from East Grinstead down to Horsted Games. They, in fact, had to dig out uh, a large cutting and relay seven and a half miles of track. They had uh, sponsorship and help from commercial organisations, and it's now very successful. Passengers can commute from Sheffield Park all the way through to catch a train at East Grinstead on the national network and commute to London. There are other uh, examples all over the country where railways have been reopened against vociferous but uninformed opposition and they're now operating successfully. The idea behind the Radstock reopening has always been to be a heritage and combined community railway. 
as is successfully operated in several places, notably around our area, the West Somerset Railway. And uh, there are others. There's the Wensleydale Railway in Yorkshire. But the problem is that people don't seem to grasp that this can be used, uh, that it can be done using a lot of money which is available, such as European Development Funding, which was used in the quoted North Wales situation with the uh, Welsh Highland Railway, and also from the Heritage Lottery Fund and various other grants uh, that are available with match funding. The match funding means that whatever the organisation provides has to be matched by the volunteer body in the terms of actual uh, volunteer labour and uh, purchase of materials, etc. But this is feasible and it is doable and within a reasonable timescale. I quoted um, in a letter to The Guardian um, that was not published, unfortunately, but our own uh, other ward councillor, Mr Simon Allen, um, was quoting an idea of that he saw the railway being reinstated in 30 to 40 years. Well, we'll all be bent by then, and I don't think railways will be exactly operating at that stage. But the point is, it's doable, it can be done with volunteer tier support, as Shirley Steele will say, and they've achieved a lot at, at um, the um, Midsummer Norton South Station. And I have to say that also a lot of the volunteers there transferred from the original North Somerset Railway when we were kicked off the site by the activities of Baines and NRR. And that was having had subsequent, uh, previously fit fought for three years with Sustrans when they were allocated the uh, route path by Mr. Prescott in 1997. But he did add, as it's quoted, the proviso that the railway where it existed or there was a possibility of reopening should always take precedence and always be accommodated. <coughs> This development, if it's allowed to take place, will scupper permanently forever any chance of reopening any form of rail communication with uh, Froome and, of course, the national network. I mean, we don't envisage in stage, uh, the thing opening overnight. We envisage it being opened in stages progressively up towards Hapsford Junction as a heritage and possibly tourist and um, community line. That will bring in visitors who will spend money in Radstock Tourism is the one viable um, industry that we have that has the long-term future in this area. Don't forget we live halfway between two World Heritage Sites, namely the cities of Bath and Wells, and very close proximity to the beautiful countryside of the Mendip Hills, and of course the Somerset um, underwater levels. But the point is, it can be done if there is a will, and if there is support from the general population and from the local authorities. So far, I have seen precious little, if any, uh, tacit support, uh, support or active support from any of these authorities, despite the facts that we have presented. I largely agree with what you're saying. The problem is, is that a lot of the background issues uh, complicate those matters further. Um, I, I actually originate from Plymouth, uh, I don't live in that very often, um, where, quite comparable to here actually, uh, there is currently a scheme to reconnect the town of Tavistock with Plymouth. Now, Tavistock is a substantial town, I would suggest it's probably bigger than here in the house. Um, and like Radstock, Tavistock, uh, whilst it's a major place in its own right, um, there is a sort of a tidal flow with a uh, fair portion of people in Tavistock actually working in Plymouth. Now the uh, road infrastructure between Tavistock and Plymouth is um, not brilliant. Uh, probably an hour at each way um, on a good day. Now what they've done in Tavistock is they have green fenced the trap bed from the line at uh, Beer Austin. So they've made sure it's not been built on. Um, I think it's shut 63, something like that, at the end of the year. So all these years, this trap has been empty, nothing's been done with it. Uh, and in the last sort of uh, 10 years or so, a, company, a developer called Kilbride has come in and said, we want to build some houses in Tavistock. Um, and the um, um, authorities there have said, okay, you can build your houses in this particular place, on the condition you leave provision in amongst those houses for um, a station and um, you at least part fund the uh, rail link to Plymouth. So with those houses, you provide infrastructure to go with them. Now the problem, wider than that, that's almost, that's almost quite basic really. You could say, okay, houses, infrastructure, that's fine. The wider problem is, and I, I suspect one of the reasons why authorities aren't prioritizing things like that is, um, 
I, I work for the, the National Rail Network, I can tell you now that the resources aren't provided for the network that we actually have now. We don't have the rolling stock. We're trying to open stations in places where the line already runs through. So, my, you know, is it a problem that, um, I don't have any answers, is it a problem that we, we're struggling to develop what we've got without adding to our, to our um, burden? If you Madam Chairman, can I just say that we are not, the railway company in North Somerset, are not seeking huge amounts of public funding. We don't want public funding. We want our own private funding, but we can actually do it on our own basis with our own support. Recently, research has been done in the last sort of, um, uh, let me see, five years or so, and the um, uh, Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment has done some very good reports, and they are very, very upbeat about the economic value of green spaces. Now, we would have economic value from a green space here. The green space would reserve the rail corridor. You wouldn't have to show that a railway could come back right at the outset. That could be done whilst the site was already being used as a green space and heritage, uh, heritage reserve which would bring in visitors and help boost the economy, our local economy, because there'd be more interest when people say, okay, what have you got? We've got the museum. They say, great, what else have you got? Uh, actually, um, not in Radstock, but in anything else, but there are places, there are pla um, um, things in other places. Now, this, this, there's also a much wider thing about investing in green infrastructure, because this is what it is. There's an opportunity here to get ahead of the game before people in foreign countries get ahead of the game for us and then come over here to help us create our green infrastructure and manage our green infrastructure and set up a green infrastructure strategy. This area is well set for jumping on that bandwagon when it's just starting and having a and setting up like they have in other places where the cape has given examples that setting up businesses based upon the use, the management, and, and the creation of green infrastructure. And we could really be a hub for that, because this is, this is marvellous. And um, the, the, the gentleman there, um, who was very keen on cycling and walking, obviously has an appreciation of green infrastructure. But it doesn't prevent future use by rail if it becomes feasible, if funders come in, if private funding is obtained. It doesn't prevent that, it saves it. And Heritage Rail does take up more room than passenger rail. If you wanted a passenger service, you need one line in, the same line out. That's all you need for the passenger service. Heritage Rail needs the runaround loop, it needs more room, it needs space to, to look good in, um, in order to be attractive to tourists and visitors. So there's great potential there. Um, uh, there's, I, I could probably say a lot more, and I haven't said what I have said very well, um, but I do have information that I can give to people who are interested in this socio-economics if they want it. As a gentleman who's just spoken, could I ask you very briefly to summarise what is in the ATOC report, if you, if you can do so from memory? Yeah, I mean, basically it was commissioned by by the train operating companies in this area, which are effectively Southwest Trains, which is a, a subsidiary of Stagecoach PLC, and uh, first, first Group, First Great Western. And it came back with a, with a viable option for looking at this route with a price tag of about £40 um, million. Pounds. It came back with the idea of a single car unit, of which somebody in the room pointed out, running hourly, I think you're in the blue, hourly running through to Westbury with the option of linking it with this service that goes from Swindon to Westbury. So in fact, some of it could terminate here uh, rather than terminate at Westbury and turn back. It's a single car unit. Its revenue, revenue support is about 750,000 a year, but that would be met by Baines, Somerset and Wiltshire councils. Being written or been written but not seen it yet um, is the employment strategy for this area. Um, and I, I've seen it referred to in documents, but I've not actually seen a copy. It's going to committee on 10 o'clock on the, this Friday at the Guild Hall of the West of England Partnership Scrutiny Commission. It's the LEP economic plan that includes stuff around Baines and Radsort. Radsort's actually item 132 in it. Thank you. Have a look at that. He's actually got onto something there which I've been thinking about. 
Has any of the local councillors approached any of the, the local businesses as to whether they would use a rail link? I'm thinking mainly of Paul's Animal Food, who would like to tra uh, transport stuff in Port. What about the male cement work who has all their aggregates coming in by road and there are huge amounts of cement pipe work going out? I mean, surely there must be hundreds of businesses which could be approached by local councillors to see how useful this railway would be. And one other point I would like to make is don't let Baines uh, pass you off with calling this regeneration because no way is building this housing uh, site of Pebble Dash and Tongue and Groove going to be any type of regeneration. The only thing it would do is block up more of the roads and cr create less regeneration. We must preserve the railway track for this area because it's going to create regeneration. And I'm, I'm thinking of things like, can you, they, they, lack, they suffer a complete lack of imagination. Let's get back to Victoriana, where they got down to things. I mean, can we imagine that the Radstock Rail um, Museum being visited by wonderful steam engines and loads of tourism coming in? Why can't we build an old mayor market there for a farmer's markets, for antique markets, which the rail track could visit? There's loads of options once you've got that track in position. Thank you. I, I would say that you, you have to be aware of what this council can do, the town council. Our responsibilities are around things like, like parks. And what we do is try to engage with Baines to get them involved in things like talking about the economic development, the regeneration from the area. And they have been asked the question many times. I'm sorry that um, Councillor Hill and anything, because I don't know what why he's not here tonight, but um, really a lot of these questions need to be put to Baines and then we can push through from here to ask for those things. But largely it's outside of this council's gift. I mean we're quite happy to organise this meeting and look at ways forward. But you have to recognise what we can actually do. And it's like I said earlier on about the, the placemaking plan. We need your help to do that. We can't do that on our own. And if that goes in full of holes, well, then that's all we would have managed to do. And I've been working on this since before Christmas. So, again, you know, if you can come and lend a hand, then, then please do. That's what we, we need in Radstock. Right, it's quarter to nine. Um, is there anyone else from Radstock that would like to speak? I, I've only been a resident here for 13 years and I came here with my son as a single mother and I've had to go from evening to dark. And I've often wondered what it would be like if I, there would be more businesses here and I'd had the opportunity to take a job in Radstock. I have to commute just like everybody else. It's horrendous in the mornings. I have to leave at 7.30 in the morning to get to my job at 9 o'clock in the morning, otherwise I get more parking. Even with this planning application that's going in, supposedly for regenerating Radstock, it is not going to regenerate Radstock. We need everyone to be, as many people as possible, to be at that meeting on Wednesday to make it absolutely plain and clear to Baines that we want our railway line kept for future years, even if we can't get it going right away. We want it there kept so that it cannot be built on. And that, and they, the, the, re, the regeneration um, uh, argument that they're using is that it's going to create something like, I think, 14 jobs. But in reality, a lot of those jobs are actually going to be volunteer jobs. They're not actually going to be concrete, full-time <coughs> employment for either young people, middle-aged people, or older people who live in this community. And those houses that are being built, even the social houses that they're talking about, are not going to... There is absolutely no guarantee, if you look at the small print in those plans, there is no guarantee that those houses are going to be prioritised for anyone in this area. Which means that people. People that they don't want involved, they want to get rid of, they will yeah, shove yeah. out to us. And they just make that But even more thank you, thank, thank you very much for that. And again, a lot of these concerns have been taken up by Bradstock Town Council. So we, we don't, um, we can't make that decision, but we have asked again about um, the social housing being for local people. 
and that local people should have first choice. I'm told that we can't legally do that, yeah. but we've asked for it several times and we're quite willing to go and have a discussion with players, which I think they ought to do. Um, but but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. They do it in the two rallies here. It's very strange that. They do that policy exactly. Yes, yeah, well, the they rally. can do it here as well. Um, but again, it, it's, it's really uh, having the courage to go and challenge them on it. Um, can I ask if you haven't filled in the sign in sheet if you would do that? Because that's really important that, that you do that. And if we need to come back to you in the future, we'll be able to do that. Can I thank very much the speakers? First of all, Colin, and secondly, George, and especially George that stepped in at the last minute and, and bravely answered the questions. To all of the um, other people here that have answered questions, David, and um, the very interesting contributions from um, Swanage, and also from the, the guests from Timsbury. Um, but can I also thank Heather for raising the question some time back at our town meeting. Um, thank you the press as well, I'm sure you're all ready to go on to the team. Um, but thank you very much for coming. Um, we do need to be out by nine, but if you have any other questions then, then we are going to be hanging around. There are some of the councillors in the room. Um, <coughs> Councillor Bolton is there, Councillor Isabel Davis. Councillor Eleanor um, Jackson and Councillor Porter are all on the yeah, Council. So thank you very much for coming along and a good night. Questions, David.